Leaf beating. <laughs> Babylon City, okay. FBI. Uh, so I'm, I'm proper, like I'm in the view. Yeah, man, you're blessed, yo. Yeah, yeah, so all that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're blessed, yo. We got what? Movie team. Oh, let me uh, put the Wi Fi on. Camera control this. Okay. Oh, yeah. We not even know how that, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to touch it, though. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. I, yo, honestly, I didn't even know this. I thought it was just another keyboard, yo, to be honest. <laughs> Me too. Oh, this smiles, man. So I'm wearing one camera again. Oh, three cap. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, so these are the people in the in the waiting room right now. But then we get man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. My bad. Mm-hmm. Yo, this is a big moment right now, you know. Yeah, man. Take a picture of this, yo. <laughs> Don't do enough. <laughs> Trying to get. Joe taking a picture of when he get to run away. Bro, I'm not like I'm usually trying to just do I'm everything. Joking, I'm joking. You know those ones, Brian? Yeah, yeah. Bro, I just make pure samples and beats now, bro. Just yeah, man. Just been going stupid on that. Like, I'm gonna have to show you some stuff later, so. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Not even yo. I just cook up from my yard, send it to man's. So Kevin recently sent me two packs of guitar samples. Like I tell him, like, yo, send me as much as you can. Okay. Send me like maybe like 36 things. I have like six more left to go. And he's sending them. He's plugged into like a bunch of different producers. And like I'm connecting with like a few other producers in the city and you know, a couple people outside. Bro. But it's it, I'm seeing I'm seeing stuff starting to happen. So Yeah, man. Yeah. We could talk about all that stuff too, yo. Cause honestly, could get a bass pack from you too, man. Yo, boss. Yeah, man. I even sent Matt some stuff. Like, I DM'd him, but I don't think he's going to see it because I'm not really on Instagram like that. But I logged in the other day just to send him a thing to see if, like, he probably didn't even see it. <laughs> Who's that, Cordell? <laughs> Cordell's that boat? <laughs> Now. Yeah, B, it's just been grind, 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 yo. Even today, yo, I've been going since I woke up, bro. I'm burst, so. You have to, bro. You have to, yo. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. It's crazy. 731. I probably just let these people, there's eight people waiting. I let them all in still. All right. Yeah, we have a good turnout for you today. That's crazy. Yeah. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're just getting started here. Holy, we have enough people in here. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everyone. You can say hi, don't be shy. Not gonna bite. Yo. Who, who who do we have in here today? Let's hear some voices. Since I can't see any faces. No, there's no ducky in here. No online ducky. Good evening, everybody. Hi, I'm Rosina. Um, Welcome, Rosina. Thank you, thank you. I'm a singer songwriter. But, okay. Um, yeah, I'm interested in learning different instruments. I used to take piano lessons and then I sort of fell off. Um, but I'm really interested in working with other other instruments as a vocalist. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm just kind of here to soak up and learn. Rosina, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said they used to take piano lessons. <laughs> like it happens so often. Like everyone used to do piano. It's crazy. Yeah. Welcome, welcome though. Mm-hmm. 
What else do we have in here? What do you play? What do you do? What are you looking forward to learning today? Yo, K-Box, K-Box here. Um, what's going on, K-Box? Hey, K-Box, what's going on? <laughs> Yo, I, just saw I, thought I, recognized you. I thought I recognized you. What up, bro? What's up, man? Hey, um, yeah, so, you know, I play keys. Um, I'm yes, sir. And some bass. Very, very, very basic stuff right now. Um, I'm mainly a singer. Okay. Um, I, I've been singing my entire life. My mom used to do Indian classical. She kind of taught me that. And I came up pretty far doing that. So R&B was like, like... I was naturally drawn to it because I love runs, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always, yeah. always, always it, it interests me. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. And so I learned keys from a young age to kind of help support that. Well, if you love runs, you're going to love Mark. He has a whole heap of them. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, who else we got? Shamar, I see you laughing in there. Say something. Well, I'm Shamar, you know. Then with Soundcheck, uh, what's it called? I play bass, been playing for eight years now. Okay, okay. You have your bass ready today? Yes, sir. That's Very what nice I like to me. hear. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Who else we have in here? Joshua, are you going to say something today? Uh oh, Joshua's quiet. Oh, but he said, oh, he said, nah. <laughs> okay, okay. Joel, welcome, welcome. Who's Bryce, though? My name is Brian. I rate the name Bryce though. Oh, loud background. Okay, okay. Who else we have in here? Feel free to. It's all good. Bryce is a wicked name too, so I rate it. Might change my name to Bryce. You guys are in for a treat, honestly. Anybody else gonna say what up? See some familiar names. Malik McPherson. That sounds very familiar. How's everybody doing though? Shamar, tell them how the sessions have been so far. Like, just tell the brag a little bit on us. It's been good. It's been very good, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, more than good. Great, you know. More than good. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Shamar's been rocking with us from jump. Awesome, man. That's wicked. That's wicked. All right, we have what, 13 people in here? I think we can get started. What do you guys think? You guys want to wait for more people or you just want to take advantage of the fact that you're all on time? Yeah, Rosina's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> She's like, yeah, nah, we came on time and now wait for nobody. <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm going to open up with the welcome then once I learn how to work this. You guys know I'm still struggling on Zoom. This is so bad. Can't work Zoom, can't work PowerPoint, can't work Excel. It's useless. It takes time, it takes time. I know, I know, but me, man, like me don't have patience. Yeah. All right, I can't even go back. How do I go back? Oh, God. These guys are laughing at me, can't even work Zoom. Loki don't know how to go back. No pressure, man. Me and you oh, there's bear pressure, man. Nah, man. Nah, man. Me and you both, and I'm salt on it, too. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, so let's go from the first slide. I should probably just stop sharing my screen and stop embarrassing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let me situate myself first. All right, I think I got it. It'll all be worth it. You guys are in for a treat. Everyone is in for a treat, not just guys. We have women in here too. All right, there we go. Mark, I just want to see a pretty face. So welcome everyone today. They're in for a great, 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 great treat today. I'm excited as you all should be excited. This is Mark Manhurts, phenomenal. I can't even say bass player, just an instrumentalist. Like this dude, like, embodies what it need what what it means to be a musician so i don't even want to refer to him as a bassist because the man is truly a virtuoso what? and i think <laughs> yes you are a virtuoso and i feel like bass is just just one element one avenue um one aspect to your musicality so i didn't even want to limit you today because mark will get on the drums and 
make you think he's a drummer, he'll get on keys, make you think he's a keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yes you, yes you, yes you. <laughs> With no formal training. So yeah. Welcome everyone. This is Mark Session. Um, for those that don't know, this is Mark Manhertz. Amazing, amazing instrumentalist. I have to say it twice because like, I really mean it. Like this guy, like as a kid, like not even as a kid, like I'm talking about like five, six years ago, like cup it up, see this guy. I'm just like, he's been one of those bass players that for me has always had his own unique tone, his own unique flavor. He's always been, you know, just not afraid to be himself. And like, he's inspired me in so many ways that he doesn't even know. I probably should tell him now, Mark, you honestly inspired me in so many ways. Um, in my own production, my own, you know, creating, uh, creative process when I'm making beats or making samples. A lot of times I think like I reference a lot of bass players and the amount of times like in my head I've referenced you and you don't even know it. Wow. Is, yeah, it's insurmountable. So welcome to everybody that is going to get to enjoy the session. Like it's going to be great. All right. So a little bit about Soundcheck. As you all know, it's Joel Reed's brainchild. He's not here today, but he might jump in. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see if we're lucky. Oh, Joel, man. Yeah, shout out to Joel. Joel's our guitar player, our captain, you know, steering the ship, all that good stuff. So his brainchild is Soundcheck. Does anybody know what a Soundcheck is? You can jump in. What is a Soundcheck? When you check the sound. Okay, fair enough. But what in what context? Like, are you checking the sound at home? Are you checking it like? Usually, usually when you when you go out and perform live, you show up yeah. at least two three hours early, you do a yep. full sound check and. Yeah, ex good. exactly. So a sound check is essentially, it doesn't matter if you're the smallest artist or the biggest artist in the world. Um, a sound check is essentially that period where you get there early. Sometimes it's a day early. Sometimes it's a few hours early. I don't know if you guys have been to a lot of concerts or a lot of shows, but anytime you've been to any of those situations, there's always a lot of prep that goes behind the scenes. And essentially everyone's there just making sure, you know, their levels are right making sure everything sounds the way it needs to. Otherwise you go to a concert and maybe there's drums taken off your head and you can't hear the vocals or there's just vocals going the whole night and you don't hear, you know, the keys, which is the most important instrument, obviously. So you have a sound check to make sure that you can um, hear everyone. So that's essentially where he got the, um, the idea from and it sort of works into his motto as well. So yeah, here we are now, sound check. So our mission is very simple. We provide marginalized youth with opportunities to develop musical proficiency positive identities and leadership skills within a safe learning environment through musical instruction, mentorship, and performance. Um, youth age range from youth uh, from like 15 to like 24 plus, you know, people come that are much older, we welcome them as well because everyone wants to learn and everyone wants to develop their sound. And we um, came from very humble beginnings. We were in the basement of a church on Weston and Lawrence. Uh, we're great, very grateful for it. But now we are in a new space situated at 1122 Castlefield Avenue have our own space now, our own facility where we can run programming here and be able to service the community. So it's great. We have a lot of jam sessions. Mark has been there and destroyed them. Whoops. We've had um, <laughs> we've had uh, various events. We'd had um, an entertainment lawyer come in and talk to us and give us, you know, the deets um, into, you know, the system and in, into the music industry and just learn our business skills and all that good stuff. So yeah, we, we've taken, we've gone on trips before too. We've gone paintballing. I myself mosh up a bunch of these youths with the paintball gun. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was super fun. And um, everybody's online right now, including us. So make sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We're plugged in on all the cool stuff. So yeah, definitely reach out, follow us. I think they follow back. I'm not actually sure. I don't run the page, but um, it's a good way to, it's a good way to be plugged in. So without further ado, I think we have enough people in here. You beat me in paintball. There is no way. Who's this, Joshua? That won't even turn on his mic. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no way. I mosh up bury you guys with paintballing. Don't try that. I think Joshua got it the worst too, actually. But anyways, <laughs> we're here live and direct with Mark Manhurts. Mark, how you doing? How you feeling today? I'm doing all right, Brian. Man, thanks for having me. Thanks again. Sound yeah, yeah. For, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and sit down and, you know, just talk about bass. Nah, man, it's great to have you, man. I'm so excited because to me, man, you are one of those guys that's really been like just super phenomenal forever. I don't remember you ever struggling to be that guy. So <laughs> for me, it's well, great. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't around for that. So to me, it's just like, it's just like magic, you know, like just seeing you being great forever. Like, <laughs> 
you know what I mean? Like, I remember our few. Oh, they said they can't really hear you too well. Oh, okay. Uh, let me get a little closer to the mic. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me a little bit better now? Is that better? What's going on? How about now? Yeah. Better, better. Okay, good, Sorry, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Mark's been amazing, man. Like, the experience that, like, he's had, like, I can't wait to get into it and just talk about all the cool things that he's done and hear a bit of him on his instrument. Like, I, I mean, like, <laughs> I can't wait. I'm so excited. I was hearing a little bit of him sound checking earlier, and I was like, oh, my God, here we go. <laughs> so, yeah, so, Mark, I guess let's just take it from the beginning. Like, obviously, you're a phenomenal bass player and musician. Oh, wait, let's check the mic again. Are we still good? Two, two, one, two. Are we good? Can everybody hear that? Yeah, yeah. Two, two, one, two. Mic check. Mic check. Uh huh. I think I think it's fine. I can hear him real well. Shamar, how does it sound for you? Mic check. Mic check. Uh, like nah, sounds good. It can sounds go good? up a little more though. Can go up a little more. Can go up a little more. Okay. Little juice. That's controlled over here, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds pretty loud now. Two, two. One, so, two, Mark, one. so I guess let's just start from the beginning. Like, you know, tell us about, like, how you got into um, bass or how you got into music, period. Like, did did your passion for music come before bass? Did it come after that? Was, like, what was that period like for you? Man, it came, uh, came before bass. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be uh, raised in a church where we had, like, a rich, like, uh, uh, teaching of musicianship mm -hmm. um so um uh, my home church uh port union church of god which is now known as uh faith outreach worship center um bishop Aubrey francis uh uh that ministry was uh so instrumental in uh me becoming who i am as a musician and so before i even started playing bass i used to uh sit down and like just listen and like uh, draw guitars in a, in, a, in a little notepad, you know, as a little kid, you know, That's three, cool. four years old. And then, uh, you know, I, I got into, you know, having, uh, you know, toy guitars, toy instruments. And then it wasn't until like, uh, maybe about four or five where I started getting a bit of formal training on a piano by the name, uh, by, by a lady of the name of uh, uh, Merlene. Um, Shout out Merlene one time. Dixon. Shout out Merlene Dixon. <laughs> OG, she taught a lot of people, uh, uh, to name a few, uh, Joel Chambers, Andrew Beresford. Okay. Uh, Pastor Andrew Beresford, I should say, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Calvin, Pastor Calvin as well, too. Wow, well. some heavy hitters. Yeah, so I didn't know until years later, right, that they were, like, also students. Mm -hmm. um, but she was at her church, and, like, so her kids, uh, myself, uh, my close friends, Andre, Adrian, Francis, Francis Bros, uh, who I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, uh, Debbie, uh, Martin, uh, Ransom, you know, also mm -hmm. a musician that was also trained by her as well, too. Uh, we all kind of just were able to learn from her uh, for the little time that we had. And mm -hmm. then that, um, you know, kind of transitioned into you know, trying to play. So myself and, and, and Adrian and, and, and uh, another good friend of mine by the name of Derek Martin, who's a DJ, goes by DJ D-Rock now. DJ. Wicked DJ. Oh, okay, DJ. okay. So, like, we, we, we would be, uh, you know, we're playing and trying to play drums. And so I never actually started bass until later on in the, in the journey. So, mm. I'd be playing so you started drums. Right. So I started on okay. drums first. And then with drums, I'd play, like, let's say every third Sunday, and you're eager to play because, you know, like, you're mm -hmm. scheduled, and, you know, you're missing third, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, boy. <laughs> right, so that's what kind of started me off. And then, um, yeah, certain things started happening, certain changes happened. And, um, yeah, um, then I got thrown into this. Um, but I have to say, like, I got to give a lot of credit to Andre. Uh, Andre was, like, uh, a mentor for myself, Adrian, and a lot of the other young mm -hmm. in the in the church. And uh, he was phenomenal at the time. Like, he was like Jordan to us, yo. Like, you know, yeah, know, yeah. So, um, but, like, he was versatile, and he was, um, yeah, he was patient with us, man. Like, because he was, he was ahead of us. Mm -hmm. he, he gave us a chance to really catch up and, like, you know, just really kind of get comfortable in our spots. And that's when I kind of transitioned into the bass guitar. There was a need for bass. 
and yeah, I took it one day at a time. So that started um, uh, in grade nine. So you said there was a need for bass. So were, was there no bass player at the church at the time? So there, so there was no bass player at the time. And then we had a bunch of musicians that had transitioned to other ministries. Okay. And so, you know, you kind of just have to stand at the stand at the gap and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like fall and told, you know what I mean? <laughs> so would you and, say bass is not your first choice? It just kind of happened to you? It just kind of happened, yeah. But okay. I, but I always had like an affinity and a love for guitar. Okay. Um, and that's why I kind of transitioned into uh, trying to learn guitar through, through uh, high school. And so I took a classical guitar course, and that's where I learned uh, just the fundamentals of how to play bass. Okay. Um, I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> some of the music in the course wasn't, like, really, like, <laughs> happened for me. So I was just, like, there's no oh, bangers yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, <laughs> Uh, I, I wasn't really, you know, really focused on what was going on. Once I learned how to do a major scale, I was like, yeah, that's all I need. So I'm going to take it back and I practiced and I practiced. And that was kind of like how this uh, developed, right? Mm -hmm. So with that and then just being thrown in the fire, you know how it is being uh, mm -hmm. a musician that grew up in church. Like, you know, you just kind of learn as you go, you know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So what were your like earliest like learning curves from like switching from like drums to bass? Cause like first you have something that's very rhythmic to something that's still rhythmic, but like also very melodic, right? Right. So I think having the advantage of understanding a drummer's perspective um, helped with like tying in to how, you know, I, I went to bass. Like you said, the rhythmic aspect mm. was there. So the timing was pretty good. Um, and then outside of that, then I started develop, to develop, like, you know, like a little bit more vocabulary with, you know, the knowledge in terms of the songs I was taking in. So, mm. oh, it's still a little bit hard to hear me. I'm sorry. All right. I'm going to get a little closer. Hopefully this is better. But, yeah, it was a little bit of, of just, uh, yeah, just uh, trying to learn as much as I could at the time. So the rhythmic part was good. But it took me a while to kind of understand like how to maneuver up and down the fretboard. Mm -hmm. Right. So I started off with things like uh, gospel reggae and mm. stuff like that, like Grace Thrillers. And yes. Yes. Yeah. Shout out Grace Thrillers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> George Banton. You know, yep. Michael, Shout out Michael, George Michael, Banton. And so I started off with stuff like that. Uh, so kudos to my mom uh, mm -hmm. and my dad, too. My dad had some reggae. Um, like, you know, Dennis Brown, stuff like that. So I started off with stuff like that. And it really helped with the foundation of uh, how to play, like, um, you know, just like core foundational, like, kind of bass, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, because yeah, those genres, they don't have a lot of fancy stuff. It's pretty much just, like, your solid bass line. You don't really stray right. a lot from that. Right. So what else were you growing up in the house with? Just, like, reggae and, like, Caribbean-type influence music? Well, a lot of A lot of reggae. So whether it was, like, Dennis Brown, Bob Marley, um, man, uh, a little bit of Peter Tosh. Yeah. So we got a little bit of everything. And then on the gospel side, um, yeah, you name it. Uh, Lester Lewis, um, any any reggae gospel artist you could think of mm -hmm. probably heard and regurgitated the music. Wow. Because uh, it was like, that was what was so readily available to me. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't until I crossed paths with um, – one of my uh, closest friends to this day, Jerome Anderson, mm -hmm. and, and another close Jerome. friend of mine, uh, Adrian Bent, where mm -hmm. I started learning about music outside of that. Where I was like, oh, okay. Because, you know, growing up in like a Caribbean-based church, mm -hmm. you get like a heavy dosage of like Caribbean-style <laughs> music, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when I was opened up to another whole category of like gospel music or just music in general, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. So were you guys spending a lot of time like playing together? Was it or just listening to music or what, what, what was that situation like? Well, um, I, I would say like, uh, I think what brought us like together was a, a competition that we have in or had in the New Testament Church of God. It still goes on today by the name of Teen Talent. Okay. So uh, my church was competing and uh, we uh, were able to solicit uh, Jerome and Adrian to, to join us. And so what would happen is we like sit down like weekly, mm. sometimes three, four times a week, rehearsing, just regurgitating material. And around that time, that's when like uh, the Kimberell live album came out. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like stuff like that or like rain on us, like 
Calvin Rogers like destroying the drums, you know. <laughs> uh, like hits like that Pages of Life came out around that time. Like it was it was like a interesting era in gospel. It was a really amazing era, like, you know. Um so it was a lot of music that we were trying to regurgitate. Then we were trying to like create our own like kind of vibe, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was really, really instrumental in, in my development and my growth as a musician. What and about any um, musicians specifically? Were you influenced by any like bass players or keyboard players or singers? So at that time, I I didn't know about anything like outside of like just my local church. Mm-hmm. And then um in within the organization but luckily enough we had like a lot of like skilled musicians within the organization right so guys like uh larnell lewis like he went to like a local church in our organization and it's like <laughs> what like t- and then guys like otis williams like you know what i mean mm-hmm. um jonathan laws indirectly through that same some same competition mm-hmm. and you know like uh, Ricky Lewis, you know, um, a lot of a lot of amazing musicians and singers, right? You know, wow. um, yeah, like it was. Thinking back to it now, it was like it was like it's like almost like immersion, you know, mm-hmm. without knowing that you were immersed in so much, you know, talent, right? Yeah. So your your brother sings, and your other brother he like produces, and he's into like sound engineering as well. Were you like the catalyst for that whole? movement of becoming a musical family or was that something that kind of came about together through the influence of your parents i think uh that kind of just uh developed Uh, i i guess i I don't know that might be more of a question for them but i could say maybe i did play a role you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um but with with mike um who's who's an artist yeah he was like right there with me like we're like a couple years apart so like he was also a musician at first and so he kind of was going along that developmental path and i think monto like being in that same foundation uh years removed and i yeah. seeing big brothers doing their thing i think he was influenced by that and even veered off into his own path where he's just like excelling like mm-hmm. easily now right but uh, okay yeah, i guess you can attribute it to that yeah i'd say so okay so one question that i really have to know because we've had a few people on here yes sir and most of them have been from caribbean descent yeah um and most of them are first generation uh musicians how was the support at home like was that were you encouraged to become a musician were they like yeah like play bass or were they like um so my parents uh they were really uh supportive really um they bought my first bass for me that's crazy when i went to long mcquade uh i you know couldn't afford anything so like you know, i went down there with mom i said i want this bass and mom and dad worked it out like you know and then i you know helped pay the monthly payments for it and mm-hmm. back then it was like you know maybe 20 dollars a month to like you know finance a bass now it's like depending on the instrument you get oh boy you know right what kind of what kind of bass was it back then man it was an ibanez uh sound gear okay uh, shout out ibanez <laughs> ash body is a 30, yeah. 306 man and that mm. bass man that that bass served me well you know um, i feel like every church had an ibanez well you know what it's actually funny because it was based off of uh shout out to clayton you know clayton knows that bass very well you know, <laughs> guy, you know what i mean but uh, yeah, it was based off of the tr- uh, a, tr- a base that we had at the church. It was a PJ, but it was an Ibanez style. But you know, okay, yeah, legendary. Okay, okay, okay. Well, Mark, I think it's about that time. All you right. can play us your first track. All right. So we've been talking a lot, you know, getting all this information. But I guess none of this means anything unless you guys actually hear that this guy can actually play. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm gonna so- shut up for a bit and let you do your thing. All right, so. Uh, I'm going to be playing a song uh, by my brother, and uh, his name is Michael Manners. Uh He's an artist in the city here, a gospel artist. And so he released a song with uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Daniel Ojo, a phenomenal artist based out of Ottawa. Uh, the song is called Holy. So I had the pleasure of playing on it, and I'm just going to play and hope you guys enjoy. All right, here we go.
you ate today man but <laughs> <laughs> comments are going crazy man people are throwing in fire emojis a man said you're a sicko someone said it's the lick at the end for me there's some applause in there someone's just vomiting in the chat <laughs> oh, man. it's crazy man i think you're the perfect guy to like talk about developing your own sound your own tone like because like I always find like as a bass player you sound very unique like you you very much so sound like yourself like when I hear you like I can tell the difference between you and like a Wade a Laws or whoever like an Athol like you really do stand out and it's not to say like anyone's better or worse or whatever it's just it's just different and it's like yeah I think I think I think you're a great person to talk to about that so I guess I guess let's start there like what what is like developing your own voice or finding your own voice or developing your own technique like what does that what does that mean to you and how did you like accomplish that well um it took a, it took a little while still you know what I mean because you have to be um you have to be confident in yourself right and a lot of times us as uh you know young and upcoming musicians half the battle is just having the self confidence to um you know try things that you hear right so um for me that was number one thing and then so know, that confidence that confidence is that something that you feel like you have to develop over time sort of thing or is that sure. outside of your instrument okay um i would say i would say both but um i think that was that was key on the instrument and that came from just repetition and you know understanding you know from from the names that you mentioned who are all phenomenal and all you know, played a really big role in my development as a bass player, especially in the mm -hmm. gospel circle in this in the city. Um, I realized that you know, 
in order to sound different, I've got to, you know, listen to or ingest different uh, material. And so, you know, I guess that's the first thing, like understanding that, you know, you have your own sound, that you are an individual in yourself. Like just like, you know, for instance, how you play piano, Brian, like it's not the same way as, you know, like Jerome or, you know, Kirk mm -hmm. or whoever would play piano. Mm -hmm. But that also comes with just spending time with yourself, knowing who you are, how you want to sound and being confident in that. I think that's key, like understanding what you want yourself to sound like and not being afraid to explore that right? and whatever it takes to explore that. So like things like transcribing, putting the information that you want to sound like in inside of you. So whether that's by your ear or literally by lifting it note by note, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, that I would say is key. How much of that do you feel is like a conscious effort versus something that just happened like over time? Um, like, do you I just consciously wake up and say, like, I'm going to develop my own sound. I'm going to be this person. Or did you, do you feel like it came over time through like listening to different types of music or ingesting different types of, it you came know, over time for sure. Um, and, um, yeah, because you, you, you ingest the music and then, you know, you know, you hear somebody's interpretation on it, uh, after you like lift it and right. you're like, okay, well, how do I put my own spin on this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, Maybe I would have done this. And you experiment and you try. Um, but the important thing with that is understanding, you know, why they did what they did and how they did it, right? You know, mm -hmm. right? so that, those are important keys in that as well, too. Okay. So with your own sound now and developing, you've had the opportunity you've had to have had a lot of uh, different experiences. Yeah. So we know that you've done a lot of, um, for, th for those that don't know, he's done a lot of recordings. A lot of them have been live recordings. Maybe talk about the difference between um, the studio sessions versus live sessions. Uh, you know what? Um, for me, like, again, I, I was very fortunate to get involved in like recordings even before like big productions. Yeah. So again, my good brother Clayton, you know, uh, we'd be in his basement recording sessions, you know, recording live mock demos. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the studio aspect, I, I think I had a, a pretty good handle on. Um, just from reputation, because we, I mean, he can attest to this in the chat. We were at his house like almost every day, recording, wow. recording, 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 daily. And so the studio thing I got comfortable with because it became normal. The live now, it was like, oh man, you know, because uh, again, that comes with repetition. So the first couple live recordings, um, it was uh, it was different because now. I think the thing that translates between the two of them is the execution. But what you don't get in, in the live element that you get in the studio element is you can stop, go back over, right? Whereas live, it's like, you know, you're there. So the execution is in the moment and you got to like, you know, the pressure is, I guess, I would say higher, I, I think, for myself personally. And so okay. it took me a kind of a while with more repetition to get that. So I think that will be the major difference where you will have the benefit of maybe stopping and starting in the studio live it's kind of like yeah you gotta be on your p's and q's okay so for someone that's like an aspiring musician that you know desires to be able to do live recordings or studio recordings for that matter what would be your advice to them and how did you get into it and you know how do you become a, a person that's on call for sessions well i think that just comes from just uh executing the opportunities you get um i would say for for young and up-and-coming musicians i would say um you know invest in uh you know a, a recording setup if you can um and if you can't even like your smartphone just use your smartphone to record yourself um but I, the repetition is the key so listening back to yourself and it doesn't matter what you're doing so like recording your practice regimens um little things that you might consider little like so like you're just maybe jamming to something or you know you're just uh maybe composing something or you're hearing something in your head record everything you can Mm -hmm. um, that is how you get more accustomed to recording. And then, you know, like if you do have a little bit of a budget, you know, you, you purchase things like an interface, like you can invest in a DAW, you know, there's a lot of like free DAWs out now, like our digital audio workstations, so I should say. So like GarageBand or other, other, uh, uh, available options and literally record yourself in it. Right. So, um, 
Yeah. And then like you can use like tools like YouTube. I, I go to YouTube University for that all the time. <laughs> you know I mean? so, yeah, man. Don't be afraid of that. Like I, I use it all the time. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of people around me that understand. Right, right, right. But uh yeah, man. So I I would say that. Okay. So um we mentioned a little bit about tone and developing sound. One thing I want to go back to is you were talking about, you know, doing a lot of major scales in the beginning. Yeah. And I'm sure over time your practice habits have changed. Like what, what different things did you start to implement into your practice regime? And like, what did your routine start to look like? Even what it looks like now, like what, what kind of things did you change? What types of things did you implement? So, yeah. So um, when I first started, so like uh, going from that, uh, uh, first like basic, like major scale, I had to open up and say, okay, well, how do I utilize the whole entire fretboard? Because I can't just be here, you know, all the time, right? How do I expand that? So then I started going into things like two octave scales, three octave scales, right? I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I just saw everybody's face go crazy in the chat. <laughs> Maybe you wanted to explain that for a bit. Yeah, so... Can you, can you demonstrate? That would be lovely. Sure. So... Um, I, I detuned the B flat. So if it looks weird on your side, don't worry. Um, the shape is the same. So I'm going to approach this like as if I was pulling a four string, right? So we're going to start. We're going to start with a two octave scale first, right? So <clears throat> I guess we got to go back to um, how you would uh, position for the, the scales. So I think everybody's maybe accustomed to this style where you start on your middle finger. Sorry. Right? I'd say that's probably the most commonly known one. You could just nod your head or put in the chat, you know, or thumbs up. Yeah. All right. Okay. So there's actually three ways I discovered to do a major scale. Someone asked if that's major C. Uh, sorry, middle C. Uh, I wouldn't say middle C, but that, that should be C on a regular tune bass. You know what? I'll go to C just for the tonality, but that's where C would be on a regularly tune bass. Um, so that's one way. Um, another way is to start with your index finger, right? So it'd be uh, three notes per fret, right? Until you get to the last string, which is two notes. Right? So I'll do that again. Right? And then the last one starts with your pinky. Right? <laughs> and so, so that's uh, a lot of string skipping for this one. So this one's a little bit difficult. If you don't get this one off, or if that's okay. So, sorry. Oh, my tune. Yeah, I am. Okay. That's it. I don't know what happened there. Really skip that string. But yeah, so that's pinky. Right. Okay. So those are the three ways of doing a major scale. So you're going to be incorporating the first and the second example that I showed. So we're going to start off with what would be an E on a typical bass, which would be your open E, right? So it's, uh, for me, it's going to be my first fret, but don't watch my fingerboard. It's kind of confusing. I apologize because I do, again, tune differently, right? But the shape will be similar. So it's going to sound different, but this is the form that you need to follow. So I'm going to do it really slow so you can see. So basically, it'd be an open E on your four string, or if you have a five string, just go to the four string, right? So open E, right? Then you're playing your index on the second, or sorry, the, yeah, the second fret, right? Then you're playing your ring on the third fret, right? And then you're playing your pinky on the A flat, or sorry, the, the A, which would be 
four, right? So that's your first four notes on this first uh, octave, right? Then we're going to skip to the A string, or sorry, yeah, to the A string, and you're going to play the second fret, which would be your B, right? Now, here comes the tricky part. You're going to slide one full fret over. So one full tone, so it's two frets, right? So you're going to slide, right? That'd be your C sharp or your six if you know numbers. Then your ring finger would be the seventh or the E flat. And then the last note would be the E. So that'd be your first octave, right? And then to complete this, the second uh, octave, you'd utilize that form, but you slide, right? So you'd slide from your pinky to the, so it'd be like a full notes, uh, full tone slide again. So that's a two octave on a four string. So I'll do that a, a little bit uh, slower again for everybody to follow. And then I'll do it a little bit quicker so you can hear it in real time. All right, here we go. Oh, sorry. Walking down would be the same thing backwards, right? Right. And so faster it would be. Right? So that's a two octave scale on a four string. And I, like I said, you can get three octaves off it, right? Uh, sorry, there's a question by KVox. Uh, what's that? Do you think, sorry, I'm just going to open the chat. Do you think it's more productive for your musicianship to practice with a drum track versus a click? I think either or is perfect as long as there's a rhythmic aspect um, or like a timing like a click, something, I, I, that's, that is key. That is uh, very, very key, especially when you're doing your scales. So I would suggest even with this, you start off with like uh, 70 BPM and just slowly go through it. Um, and that's how I approach like the two octave scales um, with regards to playing bass. And then the three octave scale would be based off something similar as well too. So if we're going from the open E um, it would be the same pattern, which is again, open E, So that's pretty much that, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, man. Thank you, thank you. Um, another question I want to ask, because um, yes, it's part of tone and it's part of you know developing your voice. So you use different types of bases, right? Yes, you obviously didn't stay with the Ibanez. So what 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 bass did you transition to after, and what bases are you using now? Oh boy, Clayton, you have to go help me out on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after the Ibanez, um, I actually upgraded to another Ibanez. So I went from the 306 to the 705. Yeah. So Someone said 705? Green Goblin. Clayton said Green Goblin. Uh, Green Goblin. Okay, we have to touch that one in a little bit. Green Goblin. No, no, yeah, orange. That's right. orange. Orange, that's yeah, right. It's 705. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you I went from to Ibanez to another Ibanez. Was it four string again? Ibanez. No. So funny enough, I, I got a six string off rip. Yeah. 
I was very You started on a six string. Well, I started off on a four string at church, but that wasn't my bass. Oh so my god. Four string, then I played a little bit of a five string, so it was a fender. So yeah, I guess those weren't my basses, but I started off on a four string, then I went to a five string squire. Right, but, but your personal really bass was six string. But my personal wow. first bass was a six string <laughs> bass, and I got it because hey man, those six strings it was three hundred bucks. That just yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no clue how to play it, but oh, <laughs> wow. sure as heck I got it right. So, um, so yeah, so then I downgraded and went to the seven hundred five, which was this uh, amber. It was a, a beautiful bass, um, and then I started having a little bit of problems with it, and then that's when I got the picture you see. The bass you see in the picture, uh, the Fender, uh, yeah, Ruby. Um, so that's when I had gotten that bass, and that bass changed my life. Uh, shout out to Jerome Anderson, because uh, if it wasn't for him, I would have probably saw that bass in Long McQuaid and said, yeah, that looks disgusting. I'm not taking that up. Yeah, so would he recommend up. saying that that was a good one? That was an amazing bass, and I think uh, as the years went on, like the versatility that I got from that sound, like I could get a vintage sound, I could get a modern sound, there was no genre that I couldn't play on that bass. That bass recorded on so many recordings, so many albums. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was an am amazing bass. And then from that, I, I got another couple of basses. Uh, I went through a lot of basses. So I had a Ken Smith bass at one, at one point. And uh, it was a really nice bass. Um, then I also had a Keith Roscoe, uh, a really versatile bass as well, too. Do you still have the Roscoe? No, nah, I don't have okay. the Roscoe. I, I don't okay. have a Fender either, so... You got rid of the Fender. Yeah, that's no how I, way. That's how I was able to get this gem. Okay, okay, okay. And so uh, right now, currently, I have four bases in my possession. So I have this, as you can hear, the mm. MTD. Uh, it's a and that's the latest edition. Five three five. Yeah, this is the late or one of the latest editions. Uh, I also have a Yamaha four seven four seven uh, four seven six or four seven five. Mm -hmm. But it's a nice uh, lower end bass, but I love the way it feels and I love the way it sounds. I also just purchased a, a Fender Squire bass that I'm kind of doing a project on. It's okay. Be like a Frankenstein kind of thing. So it's just yeah, sound, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. And then I locked into a vintage four string uh, Ampeg bass. Like this is like from the 70s. The thing is, wow, amazing. wow. So it's really nice vintage sound. And so that was, those are the basses I'm playing right now. Um, so what 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 different types of um, tones are you able to achieve with those different bases? Like, what purposes did they serve? So this bass I'm I'm rocking with right here right now is probably the most versatile. So it's a very modern sounding bass. Um, it's evenly balanced, uh, uh, but I can achieve any genre with this bass um, in terms of the sound wise. The Yamaha bass um, is is more of like a a, a kind of like a, a vintage sounding bass due to the circuitry and the composition of it. Mm. And so I, I do a lot of like uh like gospel like recordings. Right, right. Or like like church stuff with it. Um occasionally I bring it out to like um other stuff like if I'm playing like uh vintage tunes or whatever the case would be, that bass works for that. Same with the jazz bass as well too. Uh, more vintage sounding but again very versatile. I, I think that's my my uh niche. I love versatile sounding instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, so the wood composition sometimes does change from bass to bass, but um, yeah, um, I don't mind those at all. And then the last bass I just strictly use like for just old school, like the four string. Mm -hmm. um, uh, K Vox asks a question: Are you familiar with Marcus Miller Sire basses? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, those are amazing basses for the price point, uh, versatility like uh, like no other. A, a good friend of mine, uh, Kemi. Kemi Ciel, I think he was on here a couple yeah, of days yeah. ago. The man, yo. Yeah, man. He, his Sire M2 is a beast. I mean, he is a beast, too. He is a beast. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, he's got, like, uh, what I would say is a modern sounding. So I don't know if you guys have been in here. Uh, Joshua, you asked a question uh, with regards to a modern sounding bass. So I think if you were around to hear Kemi, his bass is kind of what you would distinguish as, like, maybe a modern sounding kind of bass in terms of the tonality. And then what I would consider like a vintage sounding bass is like a, like a jazz kind of style bass. Yeah. Like, so like a Fender jazz kind of, you know. Yeah, um, you guys so, ever listen to like um, Stevie Wonder or yeah, Michael Jackson? Yeah, that old exactly. school kind of, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So that kind of P or that kind of like, yeah, exactly. Like a PJ, exactly. Mm -hmm, you got mm -hmm. it, Shamar. Yeah, so like a PJ sounding kind of, you know. Um, so with versatile basses, do you feel like you need them because you play so many different genres? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to have, you know, the versatility. And I think within each bass, everyone has a different voice. So like this bass, another thing uh, for, for, for everybody to, to, to take stock or take notice with, um, KVOX said, thinking about getting one. Yeah, he should, yo. And yeah, his, his cover was incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, wood composition. So the lighter the wood, typically the brighter it sounds. The darker the wood, the deeper or the more dense it sounds, right? So if you're getting like a, a bass with, let's say, like an ash body, uh, a rosewood fretboard, typically mm -hmm. that bass is going to sound pretty even. Like uh, the ash um, is pretty solid sounding um, bass. But if you were, let's say, to reverse it, so let's say your, your bass is walnut, or like a darker wood and your your fretboard is lighter like so like maple or whatever the case would be then it's going to be pretty aggressive deep aggressive sounding so that's another key like especially when you get into like custom and like luthiers that kind of stuff you know what i mean like that kind of stuff does also play a big part or a big role in you know how your bass sounds yeah okay so let's go scenario wise let's say you're at a church on sunday mm -hmm. what bass are you going with what's your what's your initial MTD. MTD. Yes, okay. Okay. You're on. Uh, you're on a jazz gig. You're at the. You're at the. Uh, what's that cafe downtown called? Oh, the Rex. Uh, yeah, you're at the Rex. Yeah, I'll probably bring. I'll probably. Yeah, honestly, I'll probably bring this, or I would probably bring uh, the the jazz bass. You okay. Know, um, Bears Hammond just came to town, and he needs yeah, a reggae yeah, bass player. Yeah, yeah. If, the jazz. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay exactly let's say let's say you're doing one of those sessions with um adrian ben like he's doing a clinic mtd mtd yeah so so the mtd wins more, more times then yeah like like when i purchased this instrument um and again i got a shout out um my good friend joel yo um and D my good friend david prasad uh they spotted this bass at a local long McQuaid, and they swung the lab and i said yeah I gotta do okay. this, yeah. So, okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 I tried this instrument out, and I just knew off rip this was like probably the greatest instrument I've ever touched. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah. enough talking about this beautiful instrument. You have another track ready for us, <laughs> lined up, ready to go. Yeah, I, I, I have something uh, interesting here. So. Okay. Uh, what do you got for us? This is a practice tool that I use all the time, and it's called Ariel Pro. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or if you've ever heard of it. But this is a big part of my uh, practice regimen. And so what I have is not the exact version, but a variation of Spain. Uh, so <laughs> everybody was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to play through it. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy. But yeah, all right, here we go. <laughs> Hey, shout out to my boy, Sid. I see you, Sid. Yes, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
<laughs> that was a workout. <laughs> and that that's your practice track. Yeah, I like to practice to that um <laughs> a lot. Like I like to jam to that. Um there's a wow. lot of changes into it in it and um yeah, and also like with this app, um it's helped me a lot with just like what reading app is charts. It? What app? iReal Pro. iReal Pro, okay. Yeah, so it's helped me a lot with like reading charts or like just reading like chord like your slash charts. Um Especially on the fly, like when you get a lot of like songs that you don't know thrown at you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I like to practice to that. There's another one that I like to practice to that uh, uh, I, I'll probably use the next time we do a play a playthrough. Um, and I got that from the OG, the Wise Sage, Rich Brown. Who was oh, a wow. Musician. I went to a clinic of his and man, it changed my life. y'all. So yeah. that guy's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I have a question about soloing. Well, someone asked a, qu a question about soloing te techniques. Yeah. Can you break down some of like Sorry. what goes into um, soloing? So um, with that, <laughs> I'm just reading some of these comments. You, know, you guys are killing me, man. But uh, yeah, um, with that, that, that comes from understanding um, it comes from understanding sometimes what you're hearing. So um, I would say, like, learning, like, basic, like, arpeggios, basic triads has helped a lot in developing vocabulary. What so, are arpeggios? So, yeah. So arpeggios are basically breaking down a chord, like the intervals of a chord, right? So okay. um, when you have a major, let's say a major seven, like, in C, major C arpeggio would be C E G, right? And then, like, if you're talking about a seven, a major seven, that'd be if we're in C, C E G E, right? So just playing the notes inside a chord. Right, exactly. Okay, so gotcha. playing the notes inside of a chord. And so, understanding um, that um, has helped a lot with identifying what's being played and then a mixture of that. And then the, I guess, I think one of the most mysterious things for a lot of bass players, modes, 
and how to uh, put those into uh, use. Um, so like understanding your major modes and um, again, uh, uh, like so there's seven modes in the major scale, uh, the Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, uh, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian, right? So understanding how those work. Um, and then I would say things like, again, the, arpeggi the, the arpeggios and then intervals. So things like thirds, fourths, um, fifths, sixths, right? And then uh, something that I, I learned like early on, uh, pentatonic scales. I use all those kind of things in my soloing. Mm -hmm. um so uh that's kind of how i put phrases together but it comes from understanding the most important thing is understanding the chords that you're playing over and so my suggestion in terms of starting soloing start with basic like two five ones so this app again is a perfect uh way to use that or even youtube university like i said go back to youtube university you know type in two five one progressions like major progressions you can find like basic like just progressions in which you can like experiment with and uh develop your vocabulary that's what i did and that's how i was able to um uh develop that um for me kbox I'm, I'm not really a singer before i uh do that uh, i know a lot of guys uh do that um but uh i i don't um yeah um Yes. Someone also asked, um, how to incorporate major and minor two five ones into practice? Mm. Okay, so like, um, see now the way I look at things is like everything could be a two five one. So I know like, for instance, like a lot of my foundation with music is gospel. Mm -hmm. So a seven three six to me is a two five one. Just yeah, just minor, yeah. right? You know what I mean. So okay. that, so like, um, so like, if we were playing "How Great Is Our God," right? In C, so how great is our God? Our team would be how great, right? Is that so? That'd be a two five one, right? Is our God always in power? Four, so that was a five one four, which again could, can be considered as two five one. Yeah. How great is our God? So that's how I kind of would uh, excuse my vocals. That's how I kind of would it, think of it. Um, in that in that aspect, I hope that helps. Okay. Okay. I'm just gonna go through some of the questions that were um, listed here before. Um, how do you increase speed and dexterity? Um. So that comes from just uh, being able to execute what you're executing, like cleanly, slow. To be honest with you, I do not practice speed at all. I don't like practice fast. Like, like I don't ever have my BPM like at ridiculous speeds. Because for me, it's like I I just never push myself that way. But what I have emphasized on is making sure that I am as clean as I can be. So when it's just basically doing like basic exercises like thirds, right, you know? Like doing it to the point where I could do it in my sleep. And then like when I call upon it, like I can just, you know, rip through it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I would say with a metronome, uh, going back to the metronome, like I, I, just having the metronome and then, you know, increasing it in speed, but not like ripping fast. I never practice anything at like 150 or 160. Like that's just, for me, it's not productive for me personally. Mm -hmm. But I, I, if it does work for you, then that's that's cool. Like I'm not opposed to, you know, trying things. And I, I, one of my good friends, Jonathan Laws, uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of him in this chat, um, but he's an absolute monster. But he's a guy that does that, right? You know, it's, his speed is incredible. But mm -hmm. for me, I've never had to do that to get my speed. My speed has always come from repetition and just making things clean and clear, right? Okay. So, yeah. Awesome. So I have another question here. There's like, it's like a four part question. So I think I'll ask it. Yeah, I'll break it up. So the first part is how did you stay motivated? Or how do you stay motivated? I guess is a good way to word that. 
Well, um, you know, setting goals for yourself is 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 something, especially with the last year that we've had. You know, kind of drives you. I know, with us as creatives, um, we've had it tough. So, you know, I try to chart out what I want to do. So if it's like transcribing your song, or you know, trying to learn a lick, or you know, trying to learn a different um, method of doing something. I, I literally set goals for it. So I try to give myself like a week or two weeks or whatever, uh, depending on the difficulty. I just work towards it. So I find for myself, like writing it down and breaking it down into parts helps a lot. Um, and that kind of keeps me motivated and and like really enjoying what I'm playing. I find like if you don't enjoy what you're practicing, sometimes it becomes monotonous. You know what I mean? So you got to enjoy what you're doing and find the joy in your passage routine. So like, you know, what I might do might not work for like you, Brian, or for anybody else in the chat. So enjoying what you're doing is also key in terms of staying motivated. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a wide and subjective because, you know, what what might send joy to you might be different for me. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. All right. So the other part of the question says, um, how have you been able to keep yourself challenged and how do you prevent yourself from becoming rep? Repetitive, oh. Mm. So um, going back to what I said earlier, um, I think, well, you know, actually scratch that, but I think having the, the ability and being fortunate enough to play with so many different musicians over the years has led to, you know, that like stagnancy not happening. Um, so, you know, after, after like developing with like um, my my Port Union fam, I was able to play with like, again, my brother Clayton and another good friend of mine by the name of Matt. And we played in a group together and um, we, we took on another whole repertoire genre of music. And then the same thing could have been said with, uh, you know, playing with Jerome and then, uh, you know, playing with my church band, uh, the Kingsway Community Life Center. And like playing with some real seasoned vets, like with, with Esteban Carvalho, uh, an amazing multi-instrumentalist, uh, Courtney Fraser, who's an amazing keyboard player, like just guys that are seasoned and, and, and knew their craft in and out. It kind of rubbed mm -hmm. off on me because, you know, I'm not formally trained, so I just kind of soaked in as much as I could, asked as many questions as I could, and that mm -hmm. kind of drove the curiosity and kind of, I guess, abstained me from being stagnant if that made any sense i was just fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to be honest yeah. so how did you navigate networking was that something that kind of came to you or was that something you like put an effort to do i think the best thing with networking is just being yourself right okay i, I think staying true to yourself and you know you know uh being personable being professional but never trying to be something you're not right because i i, I believe in things happening when they're supposed to happen I also believe in like working hard towards a goal because we were just talking about that prior to, you know, like grinding, but networking, just being yourself, doing your job, um, executing what you're supposed to do. I think a lot of times with being personable and being professional does the job for you. A lot of the things I've gotten called for over the years is just through word of mouth or just the strength of, you know, something that I did prior. Right. Mm -hmm. And so just being a good person, having high character. And, you know, I think that does a lot in terms of just networking. You know what I mean? So. Okay. So obviously through networking, you're provided new opportunities and, you know, you're able to share your gift in a, in a different way, in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think I want to talk a little bit about some of your experiences because you've done some pretty cool things over the years. Yes, you've sir. done the studio recordings. Yes, sir. You've done a lot of live recordings. You spoke, you spoke about um, a bit about that. Um, what preparation goes into those live recordings though? Like, what well, does that look like for you? Well, a lot of like rehearsal. Um, so like getting the material, um, so with the live recording, I, I, I would say, you know, the most important thing with live recordings is playing your parts. So with the compositions or the arrangements, like you play the part that you're given, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, when you come together, well, not obviously, when you do come together as a band, there will be interpretation that sometimes organically happens with everybody else in, 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 in involved. 
Mm -hmm. But the most important thing I would say is just playing your part and just holding your position. So if that means you're grooving, you know, you know, then you just stay in that groove, you know, you know, or if it requires you to, you know, you know, then you do that, right? But just playing your parts, that's the most important thing with live recordings that I've learned over the years. Mm -hmm. Some of these tracks, though, they don't come with like reference tracks, though, right? It's not like you go into these situations with like something that's already pre-mapped out for you, right? Yeah, well, sometimes sometimes you, you do have the non-structured where there's not really a mock or demo. And so from there, then you kind of like have to lean on your musicality to kind of navigate you through. Mm -hmm. Or if not, you know, lean on the musical director or the band leader to kind of direct as per se. And I would say in those situations, you want to, you know, record as much as possible. So like have a recording of the rehearsal, have a recording of like, you know, whatever's going on. So right. you have reference and that you can, you know, repetitively go over consistently what, what's been transpiring, right? I think that's key. Yeah. So with those situations where there's no mock track, there's no reference, how do you go about developing like a unique bass line or like, you know, just a good sounding bass line that matches the track? Well, again, you just got to lean into your musicality. And I would suggest like understanding what's being played. So if it's a, you know, like a guitar or, or piano, um, you know, stylistically, the genre will kind of, be evident in maybe the way they're playing so whether the tempo the rhythm mm -hmm. and then you kind of lean into that so you know if it's you know like say like a worship song like contemporary like a hill song it'd be a little bit more block based not requiring much a lot of whole tones you know what i mean and you could kind of tell based off how rhythmically it's going um and again like if at some point you you don't know you you ask questions as well too like never feel like you're in a box like you know if you have to reach out to the person who sent the track for clarification all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff you know what i mean take notes you know and you know do that as well too right you know okay. um so communication is also key with that as well too right yeah. okay awesome yeah all right so another experience that you had was um cutting bass for a movie yeah, yeah. what was that experience like and like well i gotta shout out my boy matt um matthew burnett um again a close brother and friend um yeah he uh called me for a session one day and it was just to dub um a d'angelo song how does it feel and so we we cut the session did it and uh yeah so i thought it was done and made the movie. Uh, Jordan as well too, Jordan Evans as well too, uh, was a part of the process. He was a big part of the process. Um, and so shout out to him as well too. Those guys are doing amazing things. If you haven't heard those names, yeah, those those guys are hitters, yo. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those two guys are were very instrumental in that. And um, so yeah, so Jordan orchestrated everything and Matthew called me for the session. Uh, I think, sorry, they orchestrated it together. And Matthew called me for this session for the bass, and I cut the bass, and I did it, and um, yeah, so made the movie. About a year later, I got something in the mail, and I'm like, mm, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and so I called Matt. I'm like, um, this look kind of interesting, man. Uh, what is this, man? This is real, man. <laughs> you know, and he, he looked into it. He's like, oh yeah, man, that's real. And so that was like some residual stuff that had came in. And I was so for those that about, don't know specifically what you're talking about, what are you alluding to here? Oh, yeah. So, so res residual like pay, residual yeah. funding. Residual so you receive a check and it looked nice and you're like, well, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was like, you know, like, um, what, what was that thing back in the day where you get like the, the fake checks? The yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I thought it was one of those. But then, like I, I, like I said, I called Matt and Matt's like, hey, let me look into this. And he looked into it. And that Hollywood like, money. I, well, it's a little Porsche and still, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it was Magic Mike XXL, Rosina. Um, Magic Mike, okay. Yeah, I know I missed a couple of questions as well, too. Yeah, a few a few of them in there, yeah. Someone was asking about, like, key bass and tapping technique. Yeah, so with the tapping, I, I'm not, like, really big, big into it. Um, I can I can do a little bit here and there, but I'm not like an expert at it, like, you know. You know Can't really but, see your bass there, your fretboard. There you go. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not really like an expert at it. Like I, it's not really something that I've really like put a lot of time into. Mm-hmm. Um, but hey, man, if that's something that you want to explore and venture down, go for it. I would say a, a, a basis that you should really like look into that's an expert at that is um, this guy named Josh uh, Josh Cohen. Uh, music he is incredible um, what does he do he's a, he's a bassist but he does okay. a lot of fret tapping um i would say even look into the og uh victor wooten yeah. yes yes yeah, yes for, for sure, sure for sure yes, sir. but uh josh josh cohen is absolutely incredible absolutely incredible at that yo so look into him um in terms of the key bass I, I i do play a little bit key bass um, still developing on that as well too, um, but yeah, I, I I do play a little bit of key bass, but that's usually for like uh, like when I'm doing like other gigs, like um, you know like R and B or like soul kind of gigs or whatever mm-hmm. it be. I pull up the one two moog and you know keep it mooging. A little cordy still, yeah, but it's okay, yo. But no, nah, that's when I'll use that that skill set. And okay, uh, yes, sir. Another thing I'm noticing a lot of day, a lot of times these days is um, bass players are actually stepping up into the forefront and being like musical directors and band leaders. And I know you have some experience, you know, being a band leader. How 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 does that differ from a bass player versus like a keyboard player or like a different instrument? Is that like a challenge? I think I think the best MDs have a great uh, understanding of every chair, right? So I think. Um, when you understand like you know every approach or uh, as many approaches as you can that's what makes you more comfortable in that role to kind of execute things and to understand like you know composition in 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 the certain degrees right and what it requires and how to like put things together right especially with you know depending on the people that you call because it might change from you know personnel to personnel but i think that's the key to the successful md kind of position or role right okay okay yeah. well i think it's about that time again to get back into some bass <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you have another track for us i do um before i get into the track though uh uh liam yo, shout out to liam yo a really amazing bass player based out of the city as well too he did say uh jeff berlin um, that's another guy you gotta yeah you gotta check that guy out shamar for for fret tapping at, at kvox i definitely have seen that video <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's an og video still <laughs> yeah all right so the next track i'm gonna play is um just pulling it up here on youtube but it's a, a online educator by the name of jermaine morgan um and he has a lot of like uh material online for bass players to uh to use backing tracks um and so this one is a six eight uh backing track so i'm just pulling it up here i apologize um but uh yeah i love six eight i love the six eight sign signature so i apologize in advance if i'm a little bit too reckless um but uh yeah hope you enjoy Uh, But yeah, you guys can find this uh, on YouTube as well, too. Uh, Jermaine Morkin, if you type in 6-8, you'll find it. So I'm going to play this song right now. There's a moment when you're just a fan. Sorry for the ads. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment when you're a filmmaker. Let me start it again. I apologize. Here we go. Thank you. 
I'm there, you know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Mark! Oh. Someone wants to know how do you approach playing licks, runs, and how do you memorize the higher notes on the fret base on the fretboard? So that guy, uh, that goes back to just the fundamentals. Uh, so, like again, understanding how uh, two octave, three octave scales work. So when I'm doing that stuff, I never actually even think about. 
oh man, you know, that note up there, that note down there, I'm actually just executing the patterns in my, uh, uh, in my head, you know? So, um, yeah, it's just a repetition of understanding your fretboard. So it comes with all those exercises. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm playing mm -hmm. the licks. Right. So are there any other players like bass players specifically that, you know, have influenced you that you haven't mentioned before? Uh, so again, I have to mention his name, uh, cause this man changed my life. There's a lot of guys that changed my life. Yo. Um, again, OG Rich Brown. Um, Rich Brown is a Toronto bass player, bass, bass player. He is incredible. If you guys have not heard of him, please do yourself a favor. YouTube University, Apple Music, Spotify. Uh, he has a band called Rinse the Algorithm. Um, he's all over. He is absolutely incredible. Um, his approach to just solo bass has just changed the way I look at things. Um, in terms of uh, another bass player, Daryl Freeman. Freeman is my guy. I love Daryl Freeman. Uh, so many records he's played on in terms of the gospel stuff. Um, yeah, Liam, thank you for that link, yo. That that album from Rich Brown, please, if you guys ever get a chance, listen to that. So Daryl Freeman's another big influence of mine. Uh, everything from, you know, uh, taking it back uh, he's played in a lot of different records, gospel, non-gospel, um, Marvin Sapp. Yep, that's the name of a couple, yeah. Uh, another guy I got to go throw back to when I first started playing bass, and he's on Instagram a lot. He just actually released a new album called the, the I think, The Last OG. His name is Reggie Parker. Man, that guy is foundational in terms of just, like, the way he approached bass, like, especially in the 90s gospel. Um Reggie Parker is on Instagram, and you can hear a lot of Reggie Parker on uh, Hezekiah Walker um, gospel choir stuff. But man, he he his a way that he approached the bass like uh, it was something I never heard, yo. Like. Uh, uh, yes, um, Pino Paladino absolutely incredible huh yes sir uh the the d'angelo stuff yes holy smokes man do you do you remember any of that um baseline from the movie uh let me see How does it mm -hmm. feel? Uh, brown sugar, yeah, brown sugar. Yeah, that that mm -hmm. is sick, and uh, yeah, so Pino, 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 sick. Um, man, and then Pino's one of my favorite bass players, to be honest. Pino, man, oh my god. Yeah, man. yeah. You guys need to check him out. Yeah, man, he he is legendary. Um. He was on the last D'Angelo record too, I think, right? Yes, he was. Yeah. I think he was too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's played on several other things. Anthony Jackson, another guy. Holy smokes, man! Anthony, Anthony Jackson. Jackson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Legend, a legend. Yeah, yeah. Legendary. Um. Yes, he's on uh, some of her Roman stuff. Yes, yo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um. Uh, I've heard of Christian McBride too. Yeah, yeah. Um. The jazz guy, yeah. yeah, he's sick. Matt Garrison, sick. Oh my gosh. Um, but a, another guy that really like really changed the way I play and just like the way I like just vibe on bass. Local guy, man. Uh, OG man, Dwayne Wade, yo. Dwayne Wade, uh, not the basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> the OG Dwayne Wade, yo. Um, he's on a lot of like um the gospel records that have come out in the last uh, 10 years in Toronto, in the Toronto scene. Um, so uh, TMC's Made for Worship. Uh, he's on uh, Divine Worship projects. Uh, he played on Cheryl James Voices of Worship. And the list goes on, you know. Um, he's just that guy. He's, uh, 
it, it blazed a trail for a lot of us guys coming through. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, man, for sure. Um, Someone asked, um, what do you do when you run out of ideas? When you have no fresh ideas? I always just try to find um, inspiration on um, in just different things. Like my mind, like I'm so like open to just new concepts, new uh, musical concepts. Like, like for instance, like just like understanding, like um, what's it called? Understanding. Um, understanding like how to like play like just um intervals like that came from like chopin and that came from a book that clayton gave me like years ago right couldn't read it <laughs> but sure as heck went on youtube university and started fishing through and understood like you know the exercises that came through like a lot of classical stuff and so like just trying to find different things like even i've been fortunate to be around some gifted singers who who could just run and riff like no tomorrow and just trying to lift from their like vocabulary or just different instrumentalists so not really just solely focusing on bass but focusing on you know other things that add a musical element to you know what we do so like you know horns or whatever the case may be it could be a sitar you know, or a fan you know <laughs> <Seriously. Yeah. laughs> um you know. what are some of your Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, someone's asking, what are your tips for learning like difficult songs? I would say break it down part by part. So when I, whenever I have to uh, learn, you know, a song, um, I, I, tr I try to like master each part of the song. So I know not every song is like, you know, A, B, you know, A, B, you know, with a bridge or whatever the case would be. But try to break down as much as you can with regards to you know just the spaces so the intro master the intro intro verse intro verse okay cool now intro verse chorus right and so on and so forth that's how i find i master songs and okay okay for me uh, you know. okay so before we get out of here i want to open up the floor for maybe 10 minutes or so if anybody in the chat has any questions for Mark, anything you want to learn, anything you just want to say to Mark, um, I'm going to open up the floor now so you have that opportunity. So please feel free. Go ahead. Any questions from Mark? Yes, sir. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> Someone asked if you play fretless. Um, I do I don't always. I've I played it before, and it is cool. It is really cool to play. I love the sound. At some point, I do want to get a fretless. Um, and what is it like? Um, it's like it's 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 like playing bass, but it's like there's so much more you can do with like not having like like the frets involved. Like so, your approach to certain notes is just it's a smoother, it can be more musical at times, like, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. Okay, okay. Do you slap? That's what Joshua asked. I slap. Uh, I'm not the best slapper, but I slap, you know. <laughs> you know? I so, yes, slap. <laughs> he slaps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else got more questions for Mark before we wrap it up here? Yeah, I got I got one question. Yeah, go ahead, Clay Box. Hey, um, can you play Portrait of Tracy? No, I I haven't mastered it. Uh, like I could probably play like a little bit of it. Uh, yeah. See, I should practice that, yo. I should practice that, but uh, yeah, no, I haven't mastered that. But that's an amazing song. And it's been sampled so many times, eh? <laughs> yeah, it Rain, right? Rain yes. and Chingy, you know. <laughs> Anytime I try to leave, yeah. <laughs> Something keeps pulling me back. <laughs> yeah, man. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah, man. Um, okay, so Rosina wants to know, how do you collaborate with other musicians? 
Like if a singer wanted you want an original song. Yeah, uh so you can hit me up uh through like email. Um my email is uh You drop it in the chat too. Sure. Um yeah. my last name my first name at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat. What has your experience been like collaborating with other people? It's always an amazing experience because uh, everybody's got a different approach to music. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been very fortunate and blessed to have really good experiences working with different artists. Yeah, so. Is there a collaboration or an artist that you have on like a bucket list that you'd like to play for? Like you have that one artist that you think if it came through, it would be a dream or came true? I mean, I don't know if I have one, man. Like, there's so many different, like, a lot of the artists I wish I could play for are, are unfortunately gone. Wow. Like, you know, like Prince, uh, Whitney, you know. Wow. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, that's a tough one to answer still. I'm not going to lie. That is pretty a tough one. But I would say if I could, like, let's say, you know, take death aside, it probably would be Prince. I love Prince, man. <laughs> K Box and Stevie's still here. <laughs> Yo, I forgot about Stevie. Stevie. I think yes. everybody forgets the man's yes. still alive. <laughs> yes, Stevie. That's it right there. Yeah. Steve, how could I forget about Stevie, man? I, and Shaka I Khan. Yo, you guys. Those are two people I think yeah. people forget. Oh, and Shaw Day's still alive, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Nah, She's out see, here. See, now I'm getting licked with the shots now. Your man's like, look, I got it. See, I, I got you. Yeah, man. <laughs> Someone said Quincy Jones. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, all those artists. Like, Someone said uh, LMAO. I don't know if you know that group. No, oh, no. She's just, <laughs> just laughing. She's just laughing. Okay. I'm joking. But I, think, but I think there is a rap group called LMAO. That's why I made the joke. It's like a rap group or oh, something yeah, like that's that. Yeah, that's his nephew, actually, or something. That's actually it, related to Quincy. LM, LMFAO. Oh, oh, LMFAO. Okay, okay. And they're actually related to Quincy. That's oh, what I heard, yes. Oh, we have to do some fact checking. I saw beer faces screw up. <laughs> <laughs> I saw beer. <laughs> Any other questions for Mark in here? Favorite anime? <laughs> oh, man. Don't get me started, man. Yo. Honestly, anybody that's known me for years, um, they know that Dragon Ball Z was my favorite one. And then a couple of years ago, I got sucked into the Naruto world. And then Naruto became all of it, you know. But then last year during quarantine, One Piece, you know. And I binged the whole One Piece in the one year, you know, like the whole thing, you know. So I'm caught up now, like where I'm like every episode, I'm like, ah. And again, I got to shout out my boy, David, my, my brother, David. He's been telling me about One Piece for years. And I'm like, ah, get around to it. And it's like a thousand episodes. I'm like, ah, it's okay. And then, you know, I sat down and I pinched and I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. The best storyline in anime, yo, so. Yeah, it's definitely one piece for me right now. Yo. So when you're watching anime, how far away is your base from you? Are you one of those base players that shed through the whole thing? Um, no, I'm 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 engaged, yo. <laughs> like I'm engaged, like like, I, like anybody that watches One Piece, like the episode that happened two weeks ago, like there's no way I could have played base. The betrayal, huh? No way, no way, man, no way. <laughs> I was like. I felt offended. Like I felt mm. like I was betrayed. Like wow. Yeah. So I mean, it depends. Like I mean, like uh, I guess it depends. Like if I catch a vibe, like Naruto's like openings and closing themes, they were kind of a little fresh, man. You know? Mm. Yeah. So sometimes I guess yeah, depends on yeah, depends on the vibe. Yeah. So I have a question for you then. We're talking about anime and one and whatever One Piece, but you yeah. also have a superpower. What's that? You want? Do you want to tell us about your superpower? I work for the TDSB? No, your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> your superpower. So What's Mark, that? perfect pitch. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That it's a superpower. Yeah, that could. So tell us, tell us about that experience. Has that made that advantageous for you for playing and learning music? Or someone said lucky. You stay there. I don't know if it's lucky, but <laughs> he says a curse. Yeah. Some, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like on the fly, 
it's it's uh it's amazing because you know I never have to ask like what key when mm-hmm. we're playing in or we're ministering in or whatever the case would be. Uh, <laughs> yo, Clayton, why are you exposing me, bro? <laughs> Everybody look in the chat, see what Clayton said. That's a superpower, no? But uh, yeah, like I, I, I'm not gonna lie. There's been times where it's been very av- advantageous, and then there's been times where, like as Liam said, it's like, oh gosh, like I'm scratching the wall. Like let me just mute out what's clashing in my ears right now, and it could be like sense, like you know, miniature like sense, like it's very like as time fractions gone of out, a note. Oh my gosh! And the scary thing is, like I, I still don't think I've scratched the surface with it. Like with what I see sometimes on social. And stuff like mm-hmm. that. It's like okay, like I'm, I'm, I'm not saying nothing right now. Like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? When so, when did you realize you had perfect pitch? Like, you just wake up one day and heard the microwave in C sharp. Well, you see, so I'm upset well, you put the hurts in bad hurts. <laughs> no, that's not the first time I heard that. Still, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yo. <laughs> but no, honestly, again, yo, Clayton, yo, Clayton was there uh, when I when I found out it wasn't like a actual thing. Like they were like Clayton and, and Matt were actually the ones that told me I had perfect pitch. I just assumed everybody had perfect pitch. Oh, okay. I just assumed everybody that played music knew what key everything was in. So at a young age, I just <laughs> knew this was the key for this, 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 this. Especially after I did the, you know, partial formal training on the piano. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't go too far, but I learned like, you know, keys at least. So I could tell when, you know, somebody was an E flat or somebody was F sharp or whatever mm-hmm. it should be. That's kind of like an X Men story, though. Really? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know, man. I wish I, could, you know, have Wolverine's power. I mean, I think that's. Uh, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't be able to play bass with those claws. <laughs> You're a terrible uh, bass. I mean, you know, tomatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. tear up, it's okay, man. <laughs> but oh. nah, man. I it wasn't until these guys broke it down to me what it was, and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool, yo. But again, like I, I still think that there's a lot, even with that, like a lot more work I could do with that, you know. So mm-hmm. yeah, man. Yeah, man. Any more questions for Mr. Manners before we get out of here? Is there any track that you guys heard tonight that you want to hear again, by the way? Yeah, Anybody? I don't know what it was called, but the the instrumental that you did. Oh, Spain. Um, what's that? Was it Spain or was it the first one? No, I think it was the it was Spain. It was not the first one. So oh, okay. Second. Oh, you trying to make me work today? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go through it again. No worries. Yeah, and someone was asking about some lick you did in that track. I don't know what it was, but someone was asking for a breakdown. I don't know oh. what lick that was. I can't even remember. I did a I did a whole bunch. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's something towards the end. But even before oh, you, it was yeah. the first song. Yeah. Oh, okay. Was that the first song? Okay. Well, that was like, that was based around like just a pentatonic, and that was just like a lot of like hammer-ons. What is the pentatonic? The pentatonic scale. You know. So for people that don't know what the pentatonic scale is, break that down for us. It's based around fifths, I think, or so it's like a five. So one, three, one. So a five note scale penta. Five, yeah. Penta. Well, I know yeah. they use. I mean, I know they use uh the pentatonic scale like where I'm from in Ethiopia. It's like a different. It just produces like different uh sounds, I guess. Like different like chords. Yeah, mm. that was one of the earliest scales too. Yeah, I yeah. think Liam had to break down there as well too. Thank you, Liam. Appreciate you. Um. Uh. But yeah, it, it's a five note scale. Um. And yeah, that's pretty much how it works. So there's major, there's minor, um, and it's a pretty versatile. Uh, <laughs> it's a pretty versatile. <laughs> it's a pretty versatile skill. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. All right. So before we get into this last track by Mark, I'm dropping a link in the chat. It's um pretty much just a form. It'll take less than five minutes. Shamar can attest to that if he's still in here, right? Shamar, how long did it take you last time? Like a second. Like a second. So for a second of your time, it'll help improve um, the way we conduct our workshops and um, programs, like even having a basis on, for example, and um, the one about production last time, it was just through people 
sending their feedback through the chat, um, through the form. And um, you're, you have an opportunity to drop your questions in there for future references. Um, so yeah, please it'll take less than a second, like Shamar said, and it'll, it'll do a great favor for us. So unless we have any more questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. I'm going to let him play whatever the heck he wants, to be honest, because no one, <laughs> not enough people said anything. So if he wants to play a track, yeah, if he wants to play just a lick and we call it a day, I'm good with that. Um, um, yeah, Mark, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you still. I'll, I'll give it another whirl. Um, but again, I just wanted to, uh, again, thank you, Brian, for, for hosting. Uh, I want to thank Soundcheck, Joel, the whole team for, for, for reaching out and having me on. This was a pleasure and a privilege. And I want to thank you guys for coming out and just taking the time to, you know, just hang virtually and just talk. And hopefully this was instrumental and this helps you along the way with your development. And um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, if you ever want to reach out, um, you can hit me at my, my, my handles on social media. My, my email is still in the chat as well too you can email me but my handles are all my name mark manhertz on all platforms um i'm actually no not on twitter but i'm not really on twitter like that but like facebook and instagram same name and so you can hit me up uh, i'm also on youtube i have a couple covers on there too i'm working on putting on some more content up there um but thank you so much for taking the time to come out and just to uh talk bass and you know just hang so i appreciate that so i'm gonna give rosina spain since she requested it i'm gonna do it again so hope you enjoy and i think i might change the key and spice it up a little bit man I raise up the key a little bit again this is a variation it's not the exact spain uh found on iReal pro um yeah all right, guys. Hope you guys enjoy it. And thanks again. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Workout the second time too, man. Wow, Mark, thank you so much. Someone asked if we can hear slash download this anywhere online. Yeah, do you have um, this recorded already? Uh, no, but um, I could send a, a link. I'll tell you what, I could send a link to like uh, maybe sound check. But the thing is, you would have to have the app for it to open up, iRo Pro. But I could send the chart uh, for sure. Or you know what? Maybe I could just screenshot it, but you won't get the music with it unless you have the actual app. So uh, yeah. All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, I'm assuming any no more questions. We got a minute to go anyway, so I guess that's I, it. I have I have one question. Oh. All right, yes, go ahead. Sir. One question. Uh, sorry to be that guy, but um, no when you when you listen to a song for the first time and you really like it, like, how do you go about it? Like, I I taught myself how to play uh, Stevie Wonder "Higher Ground," but uh, that took me like three months to be able to play it and sing it. Mm -hmm. So, like, how is there like a more efficient way to go about like transcribing a song? Not necessarily writing it down, but just like hearing it, you know? Yeah, just go part by part. So, um, yeah, so like uh. So the intro to that song is a. What was it? I haven't played that in a minute, so I'd focus on that. So it's like what, like two major parts to that song, right? All right, so. Right, so I'd focus on the two parts. But then you're doing another element, which is amazing, singing while playing, which is incredible, something I haven't even begun to try, right? So I yeah. would say take it slow and, you know, break it part by part and then do it as rep uh, as, re uh, as repetitively as possible to get comfortable with it. That's the most important thing. So not how fast it comes, but like how comfortable you get, you know what I mean? Because that's yeah. the thing. You want to be comfortable enough to pull it out. Like, so like I haven't played that song in probably two years. Right. Right. But I was able to kind of remember the parts because of the fact that Breaking I got comfortable down. with it. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. that works for me. Um, try it. Probably works yeah. for you too. Um, sure. But I would suggest that, yeah, for sure. You know. Thank you. Thank no you. worries. No worries, Kvox. Appreciate awesome. it, bro. Thank you. Great so question, much. Kvox. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Mark, especially. Thank I feel you like we've learned so a lot. We've, um, yeah, like I feel like our perspective on like being a bass player and you know, recording and directing a band and being able to do all the fancy cool stuff. Like it's very good to see behind the scenes and see like your thought process behind that. So we really appreciate you breaking all that stuff down for us. For everybody else in the chat, please remember to fill out the form. Again, it takes two seconds and it helps us out a lot and it helps us to do um, greater and better things. So yeah, yeah, everybody got that. All right, cool. So I guess for now, we'll see you later. Everyone take care. Thank you for coming out Thanks, and we'll Have see you night. next time. Take care, Mark. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Mark. Bye. Yes, take care, guys.
Kanisha. Yeah. Walk, Kanisha. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Big this, was so <laughs> this was so good. Like, I don't, oh, I don't know anything about playing the bass, but this was no, dope. Oh, man. Thank you for coming out supporting, man. I appreciate it. No worries. You know, I always got to support you. You know, I always have to support. Yeah, man. I forgot to give you a call, man. I catch up, real catch up. You know, yes, so. there's, there's lots to catch up. Okay, no problem. We'll do, yo. <laughs> All right. Talk to you All later, Mark. Right. Have a good night. You too. Take care, Kenisha. Clayton, yeah, man. Me soon call you, Bridget. Okay. Mm. Thank you, All right, bro. Yo, I'm dead at the church going on behind me. Yeah, I know. I wonder if they could hear it. <laughs> Yo, I don't know, but I was catching a vibe still low-key. <laughs> Scott, you can yeah. turn up for course, though. I'm going to come over. All right, cool, man. <laughs>